People would ask me with impatience around the gold price, when is gold going to move? And I used to say, well, I think it's going to move beginning about 2000, which is when it did move. Uh, in 2000, the price was about 250 bucks. Now it's 24 and change. Gold has done precisely what it's supposed to do. It, it, it increased 8.6, 8.7, 8.8% 8 .8 compounded for 24 years. It's just that that wasn't enough for most people because most people had silly expectations. The set of circumstances that should cause gold to move have certainly accelerated uh, over the last two or three years. There's a couple interesting things to note about the gold price that have escaped most popular attention that people need to pay attention to. First of all, there's been no retail buying. You notice retail buying because you're a bullion dealer. But the truth is that there has been disintermediation. There's been selling. Uh, gold shops, uh, retail gold shops in the United States have been much more active on the buy side, which is to say buying gold for melt from their customers than they have been on the sell side. Uh, and gold ETFs have, ex have been experiencing outflows uh, except for the last 11 days in the United States, for a very long time. The buyers of gold have been foreign central banks, concerned about the politicization of the U.S. dollar, and also concerned about the deterioration of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, as measured by real inflation rather than CPI. If, as I suspect will occur, we begin to see retail buying from North America and Western Europe on top of Chinese retail buying and foreign central bank buying, then I think you'll see a real move in the gold price. Rick Rule reveals key drivers behind a potential gold price explosion. Despite gold's steady 8.6, 8.8% compound growth over 24 years, recent trends indicate heightened momentum. Limited retail buying contrasts with foreign central banks' demand amid U.S. dollar concerns. Increased retail buying from North America and Western Europe could trigger significant price surges. With gold's market share still small, there's ample room for expansion. Surprisingly, silver has mirrored gold's movement, hinting at broader market dynamics. When will this occur? I don't know. I just think it's more probable than to occur than not. And I'd like to bring up one more thing. The market share of gold and precious metals related assets is stupidly small. Uh, the market share in the US of uh, gold and precious metals related assets generally is less than one half of 1% of all the savings and investment products in the US market. The two decade mean is 2%. If gold, well, if precious metals related assets return to mean, uh, demand for them quadruples, which is precisely what I think is going to happen. On a global basis, no similar measurements exist, but it is estimated that the value of gold and gold equities worldwide is less than 1% of the value of publicly traded equities on the planet. I don't know what the median is with regards to that. But suffice it to say, gold doesn't win, need to win the war against the U.S. dollar. Gold just needs to lose less badly. If gold returns to the four-decade mean, demand quadruples. And that's precisely what I think is going to happen. I'm surprised that silver has fallen on as quickly as it has in this market. My experience has been that uh, silver lags gold for a substantial period of time and moves after the precious metals narrative has attracted generalist investors to the space. Uh, it would appear that the breakout in gold occurred two or three weeks before the breakout in silver began to occur. Uh, in my experience, this has normally taken 18 months. So I'm a little out of my depth in terms of explaining why. <laughs> I actually don't know why. Uh, I had talked uh, on earlier episodes of your show about the fact that the asset class with the most upside volatility in precious metals was silver equities. And I had expected that after a breakout in physical gold, that a move in silver equities would take as much as two years to occur. It might be that things in the world are moving much more fast than they used to move. I don't know why this is true. I just note that it is true. Rick Rule dives into the intricacies of investing in gold stocks, emphasizing the importance of stock selection 
in a historically underperforming industry. While gold equities are catching bids, Rule cautions investors about the sector's overall performance, noting that many companies have disappointed shareholders for years. In a real gold bull market, successful investing hinges on meticulous securities analysis and aligning with proven, successful management teams. Rule stresses the significance of parental law in the junior mining sector, where associating with serially successful individuals is paramount. He advises against taking on excessive risks for minimal rewards and urges investors to focus on companies with the potential for extraordinary rewards. Well, certainly the charts of the real gold equities are performing fairly well now. Uh, they're catching bids. Uh, while at the same time they're catching bids, they aren't moving up to the extent that one would expect them to, given the strength of the underlying commodity. There's a whole bunch of things to say here. The First thing to say is that gold mining as an industry has been a pathetic performer, not in the stock market necessarily, but in a corporate sense for a very long time. So investor expectations around gold stocks are pathetic, <laughs> deservedly pathetic. Uh, if you invest in the gold mining sector, even today, there's a probability as opposed to a possibility that you will lose money if you invest in the whole sector. What you need to know about gold stocks is it's all about stock selection. Uh, in uh, a gold stock universe as broad as the XAU, say 40 issuers, there are probably five or six or seven that are superior performers as companies and therefore merit consideration as investors. In uh, a real gold bull market, of course, the good, the bad, and the ugly will all do well in the market. But exposing yourself to the bad and the ugly exposes you to too much risk. And if you come down the quality trail into the juniors, uh, which is where the speculators like to inhabit, the probability of success is smaller, but the reward for success is higher. There, it's all about securities analysis. Truly all about securities analysis. And it's about uh, a phenomenon that you and I have talked about many times called Pareto's Law. In the juniors, it's all about the people. There are a group of people who have been serially successful. And then there is the rest, what Mencken referred to as the great unwashed. And the great unwashed are lethal. Those promoters who succeeded perhaps as car salesmen, used car salesmen, but otherwise have track records virtually unblemished by success. Compared to them, of course, you have Ross Beatty, 14 companies, all 10 baggers. The whole game in the juniors uh, is to associate yourself with serially successful people, first of all, and associate yourself with companies that, given the extraordinary risks that they're taking on, uh, are engaged in, in activities with the potential for extraordinary rewards. Don't screw around with small mines or small targets. If a target doesn't have the promise of an in situ recoverable uh, reserve uh, in excess of say two and a half billion dollars, just don't bother. The idea that you would take huge risks for minimal rewards is really dumb arithmetic. And if you aren't willing to take the time yourself to understand, once again, how to differentiate between the good and the bad and the ugly, do something useful with your time. Spend some time with your kids or your grandkids. Read a book. You know, drink a beer on the porch. Do something intelligent. Uh, only come into these juniors with the expectation of making real money. But dealing with volatility, dealing with risk, and working really hard – including things like attending my boot camp. Uh, I mean, really hard work. Today, we've unpacked some crucial insights from Rick Rule on the gold market and gold stocks. Rule highlights the historical performance of gold, emphasizing its steady compounding over the past 24 years despite unrealized expectations. He sheds light on the current factors influencing the gold price, from the absence of retail buying to the potential impact of global demand quadrupling. Additionally, Rule delves into the nuances of investing in gold stocks, stressing the importance of stock selection and the risks associated with the sector. As we conclude, 
We encourage you to reflect on these valuable insights and share your thoughts in the comments section below.